How's it going? How's the audio, everybody? I'm speaking in just a regular tone. Good, Reverend, thank you. Yeah, obviously I'm a little early here. It's a quarter to six. Thought I'd just get this rolling. Uh, so if it feels like the audio is pretty good, uh, yeah. <laughs> to be early is to be on time. So true. Well, I'm going to go in and get a couple things. Sit tight. We'll start at six o'clock local time. Okay. We'll see any folks join us. Thanks.
audio still good? You know, I, I went inside the house and checked the laptop. It looked uh, kind of choppy, but in the in the camera here, it's looking pretty crisp. Would you mind helping? Uh, how we doing here visually? Is it a sharp picture? You're choppy. <laughs> oh, it looks low quality, no kidding. Well, we don't want that. I might have to go closer to the house. Oh, I see. Well, this is a bit of a disappointment. I, I'm glad we're trying this out a little early. So some have a sharp picture and the audio is good. I wonder if it's your end or my end. I've got a laptop set out here. That one looks pretty good. Could I get a few more of you to just chime in? Uh, audio, good quality or bad. Video quality, good, acceptable, kind of fuzzy. I, I, I want to be able to, can you read this? Sharp on your big screen. Good Lord, I should have showered. Looks good on there. Oh, well, that's nice to hear. I'm not going to move then. The audio's... There's, there's a mixture of reports. Um, yeah, I agree, Mario. It might be on uh, everybody else's end. I mean, I can blame people, can I? That's not what we need. We don't need people blaming. We don't need people shaming. Oh wow, delay in audio, not syncing with video. Like walking, like watching a Chinese movie. <laughs> All right, well, if, if you wouldn't mind keep, keeping me up to date with that. Once I get started, I, I don't think I'm gonna even look at the comments. So we'll just kind of assume um, a couple of you are ready to, shit, delayed audio. Maybe my wife is on a wireless channel than I am. I'm going to try that real quick. I'm going to kick her off a movie. I'll be back. Well, I'd like to start promptly. We've got just a few minutes left. Um, would you mind? So Liz is off of the same uh, network I'm trying to use here. So I think this is as good as I'm gonna be able to do for audio video syncing. 
So if I could just get a little more feedback from you before we start for real. And once we start for real, I'm just going to go for it and uh, hope for the best. So how are things on your end? Video, audio, syncing. I'm so pleased to see that. Oh, good. Oh, good. Oh, I'm so happy. Let's do it, says Lynn. Delayed audio, Tari, sorry. Sinking just fine, great. Okay. You know, my ancestors are from Switzerland. Very precise timing now, very precise timing. So I'm gonna, as soon as the bell tolls, meaning top of the hour, it's showtime. I don't even know what that means, but I'm gonna stop talking to you basically and I'll talk to the whole group. Hello from Ellensburg, Washington, USA. Welcome to this geology live stream from home. I'm your host, Nick Zentner. It's just me. There's nobody else coming. It's just me. I'm in my backyard. Most of us are home. And so I hope that you enjoy this next hour. Tonight is March 17th, St. Patrick's Day. Happy St. Patrick's Day to you. I'm glad that you found us. I hope that you enjoy the next hour and you are certainly welcome to come back tomorrow night. Same place, same time. We'll talk about earthquakes tomorrow. Thursday night, two nights from now, we'll talk about the Ice Age floods. And I'm most knowledgeable about the Pacific Northwest here in North America, meaning the states of Washington, and to a lesser degree, Oregon and Idaho and British Columbia, I know almost nothing, embarrassingly. But 
the plan is for each of these three evenings, and we'll see what kind of how this goes, and if people are liking it, we'll just continue. Um, but at least tonight, tomorrow night, and Thursday night of this week, it's something for us to do, something for me to look forward to, and maybe for some of you as well. I trust the audio is fine on your end. I trust the video is fine on your end. I'm hoping that's true. Uh, I will make adjustments if it's not true, but let's go ahead and get started tonight and talk about volcanoes. Now, I know that there's a whole bunch of you with many different backgrounds. Some of you are children. Hello, hello kids. All the way up to those of us in advanced years. So that's always difficult for a teacher to talk to a incredibly broad range of audience members with backgrounds, etc. My genuine hope is to talk about volcanoes uh, in many different ways over the next hour, and I'm hoping that I can reach everybody. Uh, advanced thinkers, I've got some brand new stuff I want to lay on you tonight. Uh, beginners, uh, kids under 12, uh, maybe I have a few things for you as well. We can only hope. We're in the hope business these days, aren't we? All around the world. Do me a favor real quick while I collect my thoughts. Would you please, if you can see the comments, would you please chime in with where you are? Where are you watching from this evening? And uh, I'll get a couple pieces of chalk and get ready to go. I'm going to watch until I can see uh, Shawila, that's enough. That's an exotic place. Keep them coming. Very nice. Many of you are in the Pacific Northwest. Some are beyond, but uh, this is going to be a Pacific Northwest focused discussion. Uh, but if we have people from other countries and you want to throw in some questions, that's fine. Here's the plan before we begin. Uh, I want to do 15 minutes. I want to give you a lecture, quote unquote lecture, with a chalkboard and a whiteboard for 15 minutes. And I'm not even going to look at the comments when I'm rolling here. Okay? I can't do two things at once. I can barely do one thing at once. So I'm going to give you 15 minutes of volcano-related stuff. I have some loose ideas in mind. And then I can't promise it's going to be 15. I'll probably get rolling and it'll be more than 15. But anyway, I'm shooting for something like 15. Hello, UK. And then I'm going to open it up to questions. And since this is a communal... Uh, experience. I want us to feel like we're connecting somehow, and I'll do my best to answer your questions, but I'm not going to see your questions until I'm ready for them. And I think I learned with testing last night that uh, uppercase is going to help me a little bit. I've got a screen down here with all the comments kind of scrolling through, uh, but if you type your question, when we're ready for questions, when you do your questions in uppercase, that would be helpful to me. Probably still won't get to your question, but I'll do my best. Okay, so without further ado, audio. Okay, let's go. This is the Pacific Northwest. I don't know if you recognize it. That's Washington and Oregon, Idaho, Montana, Nevada, California. That's what I consider the Pacific Northwest. And you are looking at my backyard right now, which is in Ellensburg, Washington. We have volcanoes in the Pacific Northwest. And when I make that statement, we have volcanoes in the Pacific Northwest, what goes into your mind right away? Actually, I gave you a clue by doing this. What goes into your mind? I will bet you that's shaped like that. I'll bet you it's a beautiful cone-shaped volcano. And I am 57 years old and I still get very excited anytime I drive west of here or south of here and I see one of these perfect cone volcanoes on the horizon. I can't believe I'm living in a place with that, that I can see right over there. That's Mount Rainier. But my first message is we have more than cone volcanoes here in the Pacific Northwest. This is the kids part of the program, by the way. We also have 
Volcanoes that are not shaped like a cone. In fact, we have volcanoes here in the Pacific Northwest that don't have any mountain form. They don't have a shape at all. Instead, the lava came up to the surface and just flooded the surface. So sometimes the lava came up and it built a cone. That's true. Mount Rainier, Mount St. Helens, Mount Baker, Mount Ex and those are just in Washington. We can go all the way down to Shasta and Lassen. We want the Three Sisters, <coughs> Garibaldi up in British Columbia. But we have a lot of these, they're almost like duds, like you can't, you can't see the mountain, and yet you have all these lavas. Those, these lavas are beneath this backyard, by the way. We also, here in the Pacific Northwest, have another kind of volcano. And this time, the magma comes to the surface, and barely gets to the surface, and makes just a little plug like this, just a little knob. And that lasts for hundreds of thousands of years, a long, long time, until there's an absolutely crazy explosion. And that knob is blown to bits, and everything within 100 miles of the area is, is incinerated, and we're left with a big caldera, a super big crater that's 30 miles across. So these are fluid magmas called basalt, these are stiffer magmas called andesite lava, and quite often the deposits from these supervolcanoes are called uh, rhyolitic magmas or pyroclastic flows or ignimbrites. So yes, we all think that, and for good reason, they make for wonderful photos. Many of you have our Instagram taking beautiful photos of our cones, but all three kinds of volcanoes, fissure-style flood basalts, cone volcanoes made out of andesite lava and tephra layers, and super volcanoes leaving these incredible calderas. They are all here in the Pacific Northwest. So if we're talking about volcanoes on this map, this Pacific Northwest map, we have to be clear, which kind of volcano are we talking about? I wanna start by talking about these cones. Let's call them cone volcanoes. Some call them stratovolcanoes. Some call them composite cone volcanoes. But globally, these cone volcanoes are found at the margins. They're found at the edges of continents worldwide, generally. And these superfluid lavas are usually found out in the oceans. And these incredibly dangerous supervolcanoes are almost always found in a continental setting. Ocean, coastal, continent. Okay. Let's add to the chalkboard then and kick up the uh, level of complexity quite a bit. We're going to get right into the new content that I have. I have this new lecture ready to go. I was going to give it on April 8th. Oh, well, I'm going to give a condensed version of it right now for you all. And then I'm hoping to still have people come and record for YouTube this uh, demise of the Farallon plate lecture, it's called. Or maybe it'll be called the Chalice Magnus. Doesn't matter. So. Whiteboard's going away temporarily. Let's talk about the cones on this particular map. The cones, 60 million years ago in the Pacific Northwest, the cones were here. Each of those circles is where a cone volcano used to stand. There were ma many more of them than I'm drawing right here. And, uh, you know, I've been drinking a little beer to celebrate St. Patrick's Day, but I'm not super uh, off my game. Uh, I know that there are cone volcanoes today here, the Cascade Volcanoes. But we start our quick story here about the demise of the Farallon Plate with a line of cone volcanoes that used to be British Columbia through central Idaho, Mount Rainier-like cone, central Idaho, extending down into Eastern California. Let's call this the Idaho Arc. I don't think I wanna write it. I don't wanna messy up this thing. We can do that though, can't we? Uh, an arc, meaning a line of volcanoes, a line of volcanoes on a map, meaning an arc, 
And the Idaho Arc is a line of our cone volcanoes. This was the scene, and you're like, I wonder why those cones, well, I wonder why that arc of cone volcanoes were so far inland. I mean, they're closer to the coast today, and I thought, I thought this guy, me, just said that the cone volcanoes are found at the margins of a continent. Well, it turns out the coast used to be different. The coast of the Pacific Northwest as recently as 60 million years ago, six zero, 60 million years ago, the coast was at Walla Walla, Washington. The coast of Washington was at Walla Walla. And therefore, when we had an oceanic plate coming in, W, W. So I'm talking about a time 90 million years ago, 80 million years ago, 70 million years ago, getting into the neighborhood of 60 million years ago, the coast was at Walla Walla. There was an ocean plate that was diving beneath the Pacific Northwest, but the coast was here. So therefore the Idaho arc was our line of volcanoes. And you're like, well, where's the evidence for that? I've never heard that before. Is that really true? Are there really volcanoes lined up like this in Idaho today? No, there are not. But there are magma chamber rocks. There are granite-like rocks, granite in quotation marks, in the Sawtooth Mountains, in the Stanley Basin. In other words, the Idaho Batholith, if you've heard that term. There's just a huge volume of magma chamber rock that's in central Idaho. Can we follow that? You bet we can. There's a similar batholith called the Sierra Nevada batholith in eastern California today. There's the Coast Range batholith in BC. Those rocks have a certain chemistry, a certain age, and a certain narrow bandwidth, essentially, to help us see where those volcanoes used to be. I'm saying, I'm talking about the Idaho Arc now, a line of cone when our coast was at a different place. You with me? Now here's the cool main menu of this lecture that I'm hoping to give in the next two months, God willing. The coast is gonna change and the plate is gonna change. And the main message is the Idaho Arc is gonna die. These volcanoes are going to stop erupting in Idaho. Let's just, for simplicity, and we know this is a whole belt, but let's just talk about, for simplicity, and we know this is a whole belt, but let's just talk about right here on basically this latitude of Washington, okay? Willing to play along? Our volcanic arc is going to die in Idaho 60 million years ago, roughly. Actually, it's a little younger, but let's just say 60. The volcanoes are going to go away we're gonna get that magma chamber rock to the surface at Grainsville, at um, um, <laughs> Riggins, uh, Ketchum, Sun Valley, uh, uh, between those communities. The Sawtooth is the best way to say it. Fine. So the arc goes away at 60 million years ago. The Cascade Volcanic Arc. Oh, now that's something that I know you say. We still have the Cascades. I'm pointing to Mount Rainier right now. It's a cone that, that's standing there. It's in the Cascades. That's more familiar to us, isn't it? This is the Cascade Arc. In other words, this is our line of cone volcanoes today. Why? Because our coast is here. Why? Because there's an ocean plate called the Juan de Fuca plate today that's subducting beneath the west coast of Washington, Oregon, Northern California, and Southern BC. Thank you, muffler boy. And we have a line of Cascade volcanoes. The key number here is 40. Younger than 40, older than 60. Can you read my writing? To review, the Idaho Arc, a line of cone volcanoes, we have good evidence now, tells us that this was an active volcanic arc older than 60 million years ago. And the Cascade Volcanic Arc, with cone volcanoes where we know them and love them, 
have been there erupting and doing their thing in the last 40 million years? What's the obvious question? What the hell happened between 60 and 40 million years ago? A couple things. The arc went away. There was no arc volcanism between 60 and 40 million years all throughout the Pacific Northwest. There's no beautiful, confined, well-defined line of cone volcanoes. Nowhere to be found. Instead, between 60 and 40 million years ago, a time window that I have till now just ignored because it was totally unfamiliar to me and unclear to me, it's a little more clear now, and I've been reading enough scientific papers to have that chapter make sense to me. Between 60 and 40 million years ago, we have something that we call the chalice magmas. And notice I'm not really calling them volcanoes. I prefer to call them the Chalice Magmas. Have you heard of them? They're named after a dinky little town here called Chalice, Idaho, where there's a bunch of gold to be prospected. Actually, there's gold associated with most of the Chalice Magmas. This is exciting now. At least, that's a bad move. The teacher's telling you that something's exciting, like you're supposed to be excited. Give me a break. Gold deposits across the Pacific Northwest are commonly lumped or associated with these chalice magmas. And you're like, okay, well, now I'm really interested. I want to know where this gold is located. Well, can you do a mental inventory? Where have they been finding gold in the Pacific Northwest over the last 150 years? Where have the gold rushes been on this map? Let's ignore California. Be up here. Well, there's a little mining town just north of Ellensburg. It's called Liberty. The Tianaway Formation, the Tianaway Basalt, and the Tianaway Rhyolite are part of the Chalice Magmas. There are some Kamloops Magmas. In fact, these magmas across the border are called the Kamloops Magmas. Up by Republic, Washington. There's some granite that anchors Grand Coulee Dam. There's the Absarica Mountains. Uh, near Yellowstone. I'm circling places. I still don't know what's going on in Montana, but I just bought a new rant roadside geology book written by Rob Thomas. Second edition. Thanks, Rob. Name drop. Um, uh, the Clarno Formation. I don't know if there's gold down there, but those magmas are the right age. I'm going to keep going. You've heard of Devil's Tower in Wyoming? Hell, we're almost in the Dakotas now. That's a place where we have chalice magmas. So I'm talking about gold now, and silver, and precious deposits. Wenatchee has a bunch of gold. The Wenatchee Dome and Saddle Rock and Castle Rock. Here's the main point of our session. I'm already 20 minutes in. I, I'm trying to keep it to 15 minutes. You ready for the main point? The chalice magmas are not a beautiful volcanic arc. I've chosen yellow for the chalice magmas. Instead, in this window of time between 60 and 40 million years, we have magma going berserk. During the 60 to 40 million year window, we don't have a simple subduction zone and a simple line of volcanoes. We have this widespread batch of magmas that do not have an arc signature. These magmas appear to be shallower than these deep magmas coming up from a subduction zone. Some researchers are now realizing there's actually an age progression of some of these chalice magmas, that at least in Washington, the chalice magmas are active 52 million years old in northern Idaho, 51 million years, 50 million years. Do you see what I'm doing? I'm actually sweeping these chalice magmas as they come to the surface from 52 million years in northern Idaho to 42 million years old in the Snoqualmie Pass area as we're kind of intersecting the Cascade Arc. Any sense? And the last thing we're going to do as a group, the last part of this little presentation before I start going to your uppercase questions, is this. Is there any way to explain those magmas plate tectonically? 
is it related to a plate somehow? That same teenager's been going by with the muffler off. Sorry. The answer is yes. There's different models, of different tectonic models for why these magmas are popping up in such a widespread area across the Pacific Northwest. Let me give you a little taste and then we'll move on to your questions. And hopefully we'll steer it along this story, but I'm happy to go anywhere you want with volcanoes tonight, all with volcanoes. And kids can ask their questions and I'll just try to uh, entertain as much as I can. Here it is. Uh, can I do it? Can I do it? Sure I can. How are you supposed to make volcanoes? How are you supposed to make magmas if you don't have subduction? There's a way. The main way is to have a subducting plate break. That seems kind of radical. But most of the geochemists who've looked at the chalice magmas are saying that the origin of those magmas between 60 and 40 have a deeper source. I, I mentioned they were shallow magma bodies. Basically, we're making magmas within the shallow levels of the crust, but those shallow magmas are triggered by some hot mantle coming up to the base of the crust and melting the crust a little bit more directly. What I'm trying to describe is how you make magmas in the Northwest without a simple subduction story. And this is the model. This is a cross section now. Here's North America. It's slowly drifting to the west at this time, just like it is today, kind of to the southwest, technically. And we're somehow going to have all these chalice magmas doing their thing up here at the surface. How are we going to do that without subduction? Well, what if we take the subducted plate and what if we literally break that plate? If we break the plate, and you're like, that sounds pretty extreme. Is that really a thing? We now have ways to make deep x-rays of what's underneath North America. And we can see a couple of old pieces of ocean plate that have left the ocean, that have clearly subducted, and are sitting down there by themselves. This is a development in the last 15 years. So we found a couple of these pieces of subducted plate material that used to be part of the subducting plate, but they broke off. And you're like, I still don't get it. How's that going to help us explain our chalice magma? Some of you might see it, do you? If you break a subducted plate underneath us, deeper mantle material is going to be able to come up through that window. And the deep mantle comes up generates, triggers a bunch of shallow crustal melting, and we get some chalice magmas. And you're like, well, what about that sweep? What about that pattern of ages where we get younger that a few of the researchers are seeing? Well, there's a model for that too. And the model is when you break a subducted plate, the part of the plate that's still doing the subducting uh, back the subducted plate that it's not connected to this huge mass anymore. And so since it's free, it can kind of wilt under its own weight, almost like I've got my fingers here and I'm gonna just let them drop. The idea is we roll back a subducted ocean plate and we allow that mantle to come through to the surface. I can't hold it, I can't stop there, I gotta say one more thing. This is one way to model why we have these bizarre chalice magmas from the Black Hills in South Dakota all the way to um, Seattle. There's another way to do it, and perhaps both of these ideas work together. Instead of, or in addition to breaking the ocean plate, well, now I really got to go crazy. Can you give me five more minutes? Can you sit on your questions five more minutes? That's uncomfortable. If they're uppercase questions, it doesn't sound like a comfortable place to sit. It's so clever. So clever.
Here's one other factor for this chalice magmatite. And the hint is, some of us are seeing it may not be the Farallon plate that's beneath us, the demise of the Farallon plate. So um, if you've heard of the name Farallon plate, that's a story of the olden days when there used to be a big ocean plate that was diving beneath the, the, all of uh, Western North America. I and a few folks who have been really working through these papers and writing these papers, I'm not writing, but I'm reading as much as I can and emailing folks, I'm starting to realize it's more of a Kula plate story than it is a Farallon plate story. Who cares? You just type, you know, joined a live stream on a whim and I don't, I don't care what ocean plate it is. Well, you're here, let's do it. The concept is, now this is a map, that if we go Canada, lower 48 states, and Mexico, this is a map now of the entire, or much of the west coast of North America, you with me? Based on terrains, exotic terrains, things that have come in, we've left the KID program a long ways, I'm sorry. Based on reconstructing ocean plates and based on the timing and the ages of things that have been added to the edge of North America, a growing number of geologists, uh, a growing number of geologists who are working with these exotic terrains along the west coast of North America are realizing that if we go back 80 million years ago, instead of a giant Farallon plate coming at North America and diving beneath it, 80 million years ago, the Farallon plate was way down here. And this is what's called a spreading ridge, a divergent plate boundary under the water of the old Pacific Ocean, where we had the K, the Kula plate, K-U-L-A, Kula means gone, the Kula plate and the Farallon plate were spreading away from each other and their spreading ridge was actually subducting or disappearing beneath the border between U.S. and Mexico. And you're like, well, what's that got to do with these chalice magmas? Well, North America has slowly been drifting to the southwest over this divergent plate boundary. So if you think of this as stationary out here in the Pacific, it's probably not, but let's just do that for ourselves, okay? Let's have this thing be stationary, and in your mind, can you make North America move to the west and a little bit to the southwest? If you do that in your mind, 80 million years ago, the spreading wood was there. 65 million years ago, the Kula Farallon Plate Spreading Ridge was at San Francisco. And everybody agrees that at roughly 55 million years ago, when we have this bizarre chalice magma outbreak, we've got a spreading ridge disappearing or subducting beneath North America. If anybody's still with me, can you see why subducting a divergent plate boundary would help us get a bunch of hot mantle to the surface? I don't want to draw it because I don't think I even can. But the idea is, first, what happens when the continent the answer is you're not going to get any subduction of a plate here. There's no, there's no plate offshore to subduct. There's subduction, that's the subduction of the Kula. There's subduction down here, that's the subduction of the Farallon. But right at this time, 55, even 50 million years ago, we're getting all these bizarre chalice magmas coming to the surface. Last thing I promise. There's even something more wild happening at the same time. 
a huge, large igneous province called Silesia is showing up out of nowhere 55 million years ago, and it is also interacting with the west coast of North America. So that helps us split open much of this crust at this time inland anyway, because we're dealing with this huge chocolate gumdrop that's going to be accreted to the edge of North America. So during chalice magma time, it's not just weird magmas. And by the way, the magmas are just a grab bag, basalts, andesites, diorites, dacites, rhyolites, rhyodacites. But there's also these things called metamorphic core complexes, where we're pulling the crust apart and allowing deep metamorphic rock to come to the surface. We've also got a bunch of igneous dikes where we're cracking the crust orthogonal to the accretion direction. Okay, good Lord. Woo! What just happened? Volcanoes, Pacific Northwest. Volcanoes, different shapes. Yeah. But things got weird in a hurry and complicated in a hurry. And it just felt good to share that with somebody. I've been talking to myself in my front porch for the last two months. So thank you for listening. Okay, uh, I still have this board. I've got a white board. Uh, it's uh, 6.30. We're going to do a half an hour of Q&A. The only thing I ask is that you ask questions about volcanoes. doesn't have to be about this stuff if you don't want. Kids, go ahead. And if you can put your caps lock on and just type in, in uppercase, uh, that's going to be able to help me. I thought I was going to read down here, but I think I'm just going to read up here the best I can. Was Silesia actively volcanic when it docked? Yes. There's timing of the age of Silesia. It wasn't built that quickly. And so we're making some cross sections and some animations right now. And we're going to try to have Silesia be kind of this steaming chocolate gumdrop that's actually still erupting and building this lava during the accretion. Technically, the accretion of Silesia has been tied now to a very specific time frame, 51 to 49 million years ago. And therefore, most of our dikes opening up across the Pacific Northwest, not just the dikes north of by Liberty, are at that 49 million year old time, 51 to 49. Keep them coming. What is Silesia? Yeah, good, good question. Uh, I'll do it verbally. Silesia is the youngest exotic terrain to add to the Pacific Northwest. If you're unfamiliar with the concept, uh, all of Western North America is the result of taking pieces of land that was made elsewhere and moving them to their present location. In the case of Silesia, think of a huge island of basalt, but it's got to be much bigger than Iceland. Much bigger than Iceland. But Iceland is the best example we have of a huge basaltic island sitting on top of a divergent plate boundary. That's essentially what we had here. And you're like, where is Silesia now? Where is this huge island of basalt offshore today? Well, it's not offshore anymore. It's been smashed on to the edge of North America and Silesia basalt, locally known as the Crescent Formation and the Silets Formation, et cetera, that Silesia basalt makes up the foundation of the crust west of I-5. So if you go to Hurricane Ridge and Olympic National Park, that's Silesia. You can drive right up into it. You can kiss it right. Stupid. Uh, more. Uh, let's get off of Silesia, I guess. I don't know. Okay, now I have to go here. From my 10-year-old, what is a shield volcano? We'll go to the whiteboard. I'll try to pick up the pace with the answers here. Shield volcanoes are like Hawaii or Iceland or the Galapagos Islands. If you can picture an island with palm trees 
Great. The lava rock is called basalt. But that island, shit, I mean, screw that. That shield volcano is, there's much more of the shield volcano under the ocean water than above sea level. So is Mount Rainier a shield volcano? It is not. But quite often, if you're way out in the middle of an ocean and you've got a volcano, it's a shield volcano. Uh, where was the Yellowstone hotspot during these times? Oh yeah, in the same place, it's the continent that moved. More of a comment, really, than a question. Uh, will you do this every night, Jason? Yes, uh, tomorrow night and Thursday night. Tomorrow night is earthquakes. Thursday night is Ice Age floods. Same time, 6 p.m. Pacific time. Does daylight lava form now? Daysite is a lava that's a little bit stiffer than andesite, but a little bit runnier than rhyolite. So it's lava, but it doesn't flow very well. It's not a common name because it's not a very common rock. Most people just lump it in with other kinds of lava. Is, so is magma made of a bunch of melted stuff, including metal? If yes, how does the metal settle out into deposits or pockets? And second, is there anything that magma can't melt? That's a hard question to answer. It's out of my expertise. We need to realize that magmas are made out of elements, just like everything's made out of elements, like potassium or magnesium or calcium or aluminum or silicon or oxygen, those are elements. And we combine those elements to form different kinds of minerals. And most of the igneous rocks and volcanoes we're talking about are made out of common rock forming minerals, like quartz, you've heard of quartz, other minerals in a lava flow, for instance, are feldspar or mica, hornblende. These are common rock forming minerals. There are usually not metals associated with those igneous rocks, but there are usually in processes that I've never really learned very well, gold and silver and other precious metal deposits along the margins of big magma chambers, hydrothermal fluids and all sorts of uh, alterations of those rocks where the magma bodies underneath the volcano are cooking rocks nearby. But I, I'm weak on that. Is the Sonomia terrain associated with the Coulifarilon spreading? Could be, I don't know about the Sonomia terrain. I'm guessing California, I'm sorry, I don't know. The new thing about the ridge, nobody Everyone agrees there was a spreading ridge in the Pacific between the Kula Plate and the Farallon Plate, but there's still differences of opinion as to where that submarine ridge was in the Pacific at different times. I have to say it. If you're a Baja BC person like I am, understanding that many pieces of the Pacific Northwest of a certain age is rock that was originally in Mexico, crust of Baja, Mexico, now in British Columbia, you need an ocean plate to get that stuff north 2,000 miles. So if you're a Baja BC person, you like the timing of that Kula Farallon spreading ridge so far south, 80 million years ago, down at the Mexican border and then working your way north. We don't have the Kula plate anymore, and we now have the Farallon offshore in little pieces, and one of the pieces is called the Juan de Fuca plate. Any relationship between Siletsia and the Columbia Gorge? Not directly. The Columbia River Gorge that you're speaking of, I assume, is that beautiful river gorge that many of us know as you drive upstream from Portland. If you drive east from Portland, I should draw it all out, but I guess I'm just gonna do it this way. Um, there's lavas for sure, and there's basalt lavas in the walls of the Columbia Gorge, but those are flood basalts that are too young for our story tonight. Our story tonight was between 60 and 40 million years ago, and those basalt lavas in the Columbia Gorge are younger than 17. Totally different story for another time. 
what is a Baja BC person? Next, that's not volcano story. Maybe we'll 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 talk about that. Maybe we'll do that next week. Uh, was all the islands in Hawaii created by the volcano on the island of Hawaii? Um, if you think of this as the Pacific Ocean, and you think of my thumb, it looks like. If you look at seamounts underneath the waves of the Pacific Ocean, it looks like this hotspot, this Hawaiian hotspot, made one seamount and then another and then another. In other words, in other words, these mountains under the waves of the Pacific Ocean in the northern part of the Pacific, these islands under where that, that hotspot is now underneath the big island of Hawaii. But I think many of you know it's not a moving thumb. It's not a drifting hotspot. Instead, most of us understand that it's a moving ocean floor. So think one heat source and all the Hawaiian islands that you know to visit, but then dozens more of those mountains underwater all laid out in a line. What's the difference between a monolith, a batholith, and a pluton? Yeah, I'm not a word guy. That's a terrible thing to say, but to me, the verbiage gets in the way of these exciting con uh, comments. Answer your question. Uh, uh, tricycle, bicycle, oh, I don't know. Um, so batholiths are the biggest blobs of magmas that are now solid rock. Plutons are typically smaller. And monolith, I'm not even sure. So uh, there's stock. There's all these names. Uh, it just gets in the way, in my opinion. They're different sizes of old magma chambers beneath volcanoes. If you are a child and asking questions and I'm not questions, please forgive me. I love you very much and I'm glad that you're with us. I hope that I can see your question. So I'm thinking range and basin has nothing to do with the chalice or Idaho arcs. Correct, basin range too young. You know, that's a challenge for, for many of us. We have all these interesting concepts as we learn and as we read about just, let's say, geology in the American West. But a crucial thing is to put them in the right time slot and to not kind of have them mix in the same time. And that's a good example. The basin and range didn't begin until long after this chalice magma thing. So I love what you're trying to do and tie things together, but you gotta make sure you're in the, in the right time window. Uh, hey, yeah, uh-huh. Why is there no volcanoes or chalice magmas today where the former Farallon plate is under California and Mexico? Are there old pieces of this plate material that broke off there too? Excellent question. I don't really know. Let, let, you know we should draw that. I'm not going to draw the spreading ridge, I'm going to do it with my arm, okay? So what did we say together as the main message for the chalice magmas? The main message was when that spreading ridge, my arm, was intersecting with the Pacific Northwest and subducting beneath the Pacific Northwest, that was the time that we had chalice magmas between 60 and 40 million years ago. And that allowed us to get hot mantle getting much closer to the surface and making those crazy magmas. The excellent question that was just asked is, I don't know, are there older chalice magmas inland of this? Are there 80 million year old chalice magmas inland of this? There might be, but I'm un unfamiliar. I just learned about the chalice magmas as a unit and tying it to a subducted spreading ridge here in the Pacific Northwest. The next step for me, and I guess for many of us, is to see if, are there a bunch of 80 million year old weird magmas inland of Tijuana? I'm having fun, hope you are. Russian flood basalts, question mark? Yes, we don't have, well, okay, so let's, let's leave our chalice time and let's jump to a younger time. This is broadly volcanoes, right? Um, I've talked a fair amount over the years about flood basalts in the Pacific Northwest because that's one of our most famous things here. And I mentioned at the start of this, beneath our, my house right now, flood basalts. So this flood basalt story started about 17 million years ago. 17, remember our chalice story was done at 40. 
So we're jumping to 17 million years ago, a time called the Miocene. And we're going to make... a bunch of cracks that start down in Nevada and work their way north to Washington between 16.7 and about 16 million years ago. And incredible volume. Got the question. These are the flood basalts, much, much younger. Of course, they're flooding places where we had our chalice magma, so that's part of the frustration. A bunch of those older chalice magmas are here in eastern Washington, but they're underneath all these flood basalts that bear everything. Uh, what the hell was that, says Lawrence. Uh, probably the kid walking by yelling hi. Uh, how the subducting plates could break, he said they thought they were quite pliable. Yeah, I thought it was an interesting question too. The idea of breaking off a subducting plate we already drew it. Um, I'm not even sure that was an idea about breaking off a piece of a subducting plate until we started doing this homography, this process of doing all this equipment that I know very little about. In the last 20 years, essentially, all these geophysical surveys, sending all these signals, kind of man-made earthquakes, down through the crust and getting a CAT scan, essentially, of what's beneath this Western North America. And it's not just one person's opinion, there's a consensus among many specialists that you can see these slabs of ocean crust hanging there, hanging underneath. Again, if this is North America, there's a slab of ocean crust going down tens, even hundreds of miles in other words, it didn't go away. It didn't melt. It didn't get replenished into the asthenosphere and changed shape. It's, it's a slab just, just sitting down there. So if it's, not, if it's not a piece of an ocean plate that broke off from the rest of a subducting plate, what's your idea? So, yeah, it's a surprise to me, too, but that was a big, exciting thing. In fact, North America has been drifting for tens of millions of years, oftentimes, since some of these breaks, so you can get these hanging slabs of ocean crust much further east than they, uh, it appear. You gotta kinda get North America back to where it was at a certain time. It was now hanging beneath Memphis, let's say. Three sisters, Smith Rock Calderi, any active in Central Oregon? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Two very different things. Yeah, let's let's finish. We got 10 minutes. I don't know, maybe we'll go a little longer. I'm having a good time. I don't know about you. Uh, the sun's down. Can you still see that? It looks like you can still see us okay. Let's do a little bit of Oregon geology. This is dangerous. I don't know much. There's lots of wonderful geologists in Oregon who have been doing a fantastic job of teaching us all about their geology. Marley Miller, Roadside Geology Book. The Oregon Society of Geologists. Or... Okay. Uh, let's go back to a map of the Pacific Northwest. of the Pacific Northwest. Let's put our let's put our cascade arc in that we were talking about when we started here today. So this, I'm reading the 40th anniversary of Mount St. Helens. You really can't say much about the future eruptions in the Cascades. We're a long way from forecasting eruptions if we ever will. But the question was, is there any activity? And the answer is yes, there's activity with all these cones. And there's beautiful websites that show daily, hourly changes. 
with small little earthquakes in each of the volcanoes, meaning there's little movement of magmas occasionally. Three Sisters, one of the South Sisters has been particularly active as of late. Uh, there's changes in gases coming out of those cone volcanoes. Uh, there's measurements very regularly about the, the, the slopes of the cones themselves. So that's an easy answer, is there activity? Yes. Now, the different question is, is there a pattern to the activity? Should we get more concerned about the activity? Uh, that's, I'm not, that's not my expertise. But we have many, many committed, trained scientists to monitor these cones. And the good news is there's usually weeks and weeks, maybe months of activity before some very scary eruption of a cone. So they are, to many of us, um, if we're looking for comfort in these times, and I think we are, um, those mountains, those cone volcanoes around the world usually have some warning uh, before they do something major. Smith Rock is a totally different story, even though it's very near the Cascades. Smith Rock has been dead for 29 and a half million years old, uh, 29 and a half million years. It's a super volcano. It's one of those little pimples that exploded and made a huge caldera. Far more explosive, far more deadly, but we now realize that the heat source that used to be beneath Smith Rock is now in Yellowstone Park. So we don't have concerns about Smith Rock doing anything at any time. Uh, Aloha from Hilo. Hello. What is the age relation between the Laramide uplifts and the Chalice Magmas? Good question. The, the Laramide uplifts means basically the Rocky Mountains. Over here, the Rocky Mountains are developing and growing at a, the same time that the chalice magmas are happening. And so the devil is in the details about how that works together. And what really is driving the uplift of the Bighorn Mountains or the Uintas in Utah or many of these individual isolated uplifts of, of Precambrian Craton rock so far east the model for a long time is flat slab subduction, it's called, where that ferulant, probably the Kula, but whatever, uh, subducting at a very gentle angle and therefore getting so far east. But there's more and more of us that wonder if that's really true. So timing-wise, you're right on the mark that the Rockies are growing, mostly in a non-volcanic sense, at the same time, we have these bizarre chalice magmas popping up, but what exactly the connection is, is difficult to say. Uh, oh, are we running out of questions? Oh, I'm on, I'm on top chat instead of live chat. We got five minutes left. All night. Uh, oh, now you guys are talking to each other. That's kind of nice. Lassen Peak, California, is this where the old Idaho Arc meets the current Cascades? Another very interesting question. Uh, I wouldn't think of it that way, but again, I'm a long way from Washington, so I'm not an authority here. Uh, instead, in my mind, the Cascade Arc, which is 40 million years of activity, used to be further north and further south. In other words, if we go back 40 million years, there's a lot more Farallon plate that is subducting. I'm starting to see what your question is now. Yeah, you could kind of say it that way, that our Idaho arc is kind of overlapping with some of those Cascade arc guys if we get at a certain time. The problem is we've expanded the basin and range. We've done some other uh, stretching of the crust and even clockwise rotation of the crust in the last 30 million years to kind of screw up the pattern that we established before. Thanks for your excellent question, which you typed twice. Oh, no, here's Miss Koff. Can you explain basin and range and how it relates to the volcanoes? Um, the basin and range You may be aware of something called the Basin and Range. It's a place where there's hundreds of normal faults that produce earthquakes, mostly Nevada and Western Utah, 
And if you think of Reno, Nevada and Salt Lake City, have you driven that on I-80? It's a long drive. I did this last night during our little test. The distance between, let's see, the distance between Reno and Salt Lake City is twice as wide as it was 20 million years ago. Reno and Salt Lake City, it's twice the drive that it used to be. In other words, we have doubled the width of real estate between Reno and Salt Lake City, Utah in the last 20 million years. Why? Because we've opened up the basin and range like an accordion. What's driving that extension? The crust is half as thick as it should be in the basin and range. We've taken thick North American crust and thinned it in half because we've stretched it so much in the last 20 million years. Most understand that the clockwise rotation of the Pacific Northwest crust is taking Northern California and pulling it away from the Rockies in the last 20 million years and the crust has opened up behind that rotation. And then you're like, well, why is the rotation happening? And it's a combination of the motion of the Pacific plate and the Juan de Fuca plate. Let's do three more, shall we? I hope this has been helpful and interesting to you. Can you talk about X-ray imaging of subduction plates? How is it possible to see that far down? I wish I could. I could barely understand the red blotches and the blue blotches on some of the diagrams. That's hardcore geophysical stuff that um, I, I, I wish I could give you more there. I can't. What I can say is I'm always encouraged when there's many different working research groups over many years uh, agreeing with some basic interpretations of things like that from a foreign world to me. And so therefore I feel comfortable uh, sharing the data, even though I don't understand how the data is collected very well. Is there a subducting divergent? Uh, I'll, let me say two things. Excellent question. Remember, our spreading ridge, I know you're not asking this, but let me finish my story. So our spreading ridge, Kula, Farallon spreading ridge, 80 million years ago was down at Baja, remember? Tijuana? What did I say? 65 million years at San Francisco, 55 million years at, let's say, Portland slash Seattle. We've got it up to Ketchikan, Alaska, 40 million years ago. So there's this northern migration of a spreading center out in the ocean that North America is drifting over. And these chalice-like magmas are showing, helping us reconstruct that. But you're asking, can we go someplace else in the world where there's actually a spreading ridge that's diving beneath a continent? Uh, Central America. There's the Galapagos Islands, which are essentially a large igneous, from my mom now, so, uh, uh, and, and we've got uh, the Cocos Plate and the Nazca Plate, I think, although I'm not sure, uh, doing that same kind of diverging away from a spreading ridge. And I just heard a talk last week about that spreading ridge actively being overridden by uh, Costa Rica, I guess, or Honduras or Guatemala. I can't remember the, the specific locations down there, but look up the Cocos Ridge, and that's an active spreading ridge that's, that's diving beneath Central America. Uh, we're past seven o'clock. Uh, we're doing two more questions. Uh, will the Ring of Fire have more, have more cone volcanoes? I would think of it this way. First of all, everybody, there's certain phrases in our world that just work with people. You know, you talk to somebody in the grocery store and you can almost predict the five phrases that will come up in the little brief conversation in the produce area. And Ring of Fire is one of them. It just captures everybody's attention. They can see it. I think they like the, um, the global pattern, the scale of it, and it involves volcanoes. Uh, the question is, will there be more cones added to the Ring of Fire? I would think of it differently. The Ring of Fire is fueled by, I'm not going to draw it, fueled by subduction of ocean plates. And 
if you have a subduction zone that lasts for tens of millions of years, which is the case for the Cascades, which is the case for the Aleutians in Alaska, uh, Kamchatka in Russia, Japan, etc., all those cone volcanoes, well, I know for sure in the Cascades this is true, I'm assuming it's worldwide, the individual cones only last for a couple of million years before they die. Individual cones have a two million year lifespan. The subduction continues, but the magma stops coming up at one particular spot. That volcano gets killed, it crumbles away, and there's another volcano in, this, in the general ring of fire, in the subduction zone, popping up nearby. So I would think of these cones continuing to pop up, but for each cone that's popping up in the ring of fire, there's another cone nearby that's going away. That's the way I would do it. So are there new ones coming up? Sure, but uh, if we're patient enough, there's plenty that go away as well. Last question, we're gonna end on a good one. They were all good. That's what you're supposed to say, but it's true. What, uh, yeah. What caused the uplift of the Sierra Batholith after the Farallon plate disappeared? So this is our last question. It relates to the basin and range. It's really strange, isn't it, to think of pulling the crust apart and making mountains at the same time. It's easiest for us to think of squishing the crust together and shortening the crust and pushing blocks of crust up, like have been happening in Colorado and Wyoming during the Laramide Orogeny, for instance, when the Rockies were growing. I will draw this. But in the case of the basin and range, as we pull the crust apart, this is a cross section, here's antelope running up on the surface in Nevada. As you pull the crust apart, there's blocks of crust that rotate, different than this rotation. We can basically focus on a piece of crust. It's been a long time since I've drawn this. If you're familiar with the drive from Reno to Salt Lake City or vice versa, you know that you're going over a range and then through a basin and then over another range. We're a long way from volcanoes now through another basin. But the idea is these are like three big dominoes that are tipping over. As we extend the basin and range crust, we're taking these blocks of crust and they're, they're tipping over in slow motion. The point is we're forming mountains at the same time that we're forming valleys based on the geometry here. And in the case of the Sierras, there's a big old domino that fell the other way. And that domino, which used to be like this, fell. I'm not drawing it as well as I should. And this corner of the domino actually went up. The point is there's a big normal fault on the east side of the Sierras. It makes that tremendous range front in the Owens Valley. You all know that drive from Reno down to, to uh, Bishop, California on 395. And as you pass Tom's place and you head south, you do that dramatic drop, 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 drop into the town of Bishop on Owens Valley and Owens Valley Gorge is on your left. That huge mountain front of the Sierras is not only the Owens Valley dropping, but the Sierra Nevada rising. And if you uplift a big block of crust, you intensify the erosion on the surface. And so those volcanoes that used to be in Eastern California, those volcanoes, those cones, used to be where the Sierra Nevada mountains are today. And as you hike the John Muir Trail, you're hiking through magma chamber rock instead of cascade-like looking rock. And this is how we'll finish our cascades. Snoqualmie Pass right there is gonna lose its volcanoes in about 10 million years. They're gonna go away and the underground magma chamber rock in the Cascades will be lifted in their place. And our beloved Cascades in 10 million years from now 
will look just like the Sierra Nevada mountains today. That's not a bad thing. It'll just be different. There'll be a bunch of granite instead of the wonderful volcanoes that we have today in the Pacific Northwest. Let me get my beer and we'll do a cheers together. There's a flea in my beer, but I'm gonna drink it anyway. Thanks for joining us tonight. Hope it worked for you on some level. And if you join us again tomorrow night, you'll be at home, I'll be at home, and we'll do a little bit more of this. If nothing else, just for something to do. Here's to your good health. St. Patrick's Day in the books. I love you. Good night.